colleagues, good afternoon. We are happy to see you at the Bank of Russia. We are greeting those who are online. And our today's conference is by the Governor of the Bank of Russia, Elvira Nabiulina, and the Deputy Governor, Alexei Zabotkin. And to begin with, we will hear the statement by the Governor following the results of the Board of Directors meeting. Good afternoon. Today we have made the decision to keep the key rate at 7.5% per annum. Inflation is slightly slower, whereas GDP growth is faster than we forecast in February. We expect that the economy will continue to recover this year. Its recovery might be accompanied by a rise in inflationary pressure, while this will depend on demand side factors to a great extent. If we see signs of such a rise in inflation, that will become a threat to the achievement of the 4% target in 2024, we will have to increase the key rate at the next meetings already. I would now dwell on the reasons behind our decision. Firstly, annual inflation is temporarily at lower levels. Many people are wondering why inflation was 11% in February, and then decreased three times in March to 3.5%, although prices are persistently growing. This reduction in inflation was expected. It is associated with the calculation effect of the high base. Annual inflation equaled 11% of, as of the end of February, but 7.6% within this value is the rise that occurred in March 2022. After the March figure was excluded from the calculation of annual inflation, it declined significantly. This effect will remain in April as well. I would like to emphasize that this is only a temporary decrease in annual inflation, and it shouldn't be considered as the achievement of the target and stabilization at this level. We forecast that inflation will stabilize at the target only next year. Steady price pressure has been intensifying in recent months. Thus, core inflation adjusted for volatile components has been rising, although now it stays below 4% in annualized terms. Moreover, the current price growth rates of the overall consumer price index in annualized terms have been at the level of 4% for several months already. An important factor accelerating inflation is the rebounding consumer demand. This is evident from recent statistics on household spending, first of all in services, as well as the expansion of the demand for loans. Consumption is driven by high wages and improving consumer sentiment. Considering these trends, we have raised the forecast growth rate of household consumption. Nevertheless, the acceleration of inflation is limited by one-off factors that have turned out to be stronger and longer-lasting. Specifically, the record harvest of the previous year is weakening price pressure in food markets. Besides expecting difficulties with supplies, many companies formed larger stocks of goods last year which became possible owing to a strong exchange rate, amongst other things. Today, they're gradually selling these stocks, and this might explain why the pass-through of the ruble weakening that occurred in early 2023 to prices is relatively insignificant. Apparently, this pass-through will be more extended over time, and we will take it into account. In April, households' inflation expectations declined again. Currently, they slightly exceed the range of 2017 to 2020 when inflation was close to the target. In contrast, companies' price expectations in most industries continued to go up. Considering slower price growth in the first quarter and a longer-lasting effect of one-off disinflationary factors, we have decreased our inflation forecast for this year by half of a percentage point to 4.5-6.5%. Our previous forecast was 5 to 7 percent. Indeed, we assumed that the deviation of inflation from the target might last longer than usual, so as not to hinder the structured transformation of the economy. However, 5 to 7 percent has not been our unconditional target for this year. At the moment, we can see that the adaptation of the economy progresses faster. Besides, as a result of the instantaneous and very significant shift in the price level last year, companies were able to adjust their course to the changed conditions more quickly. 
expanded demand from the government was also essential for the adjustment of the economy. However, as the economy recovers to the pre-crisis growth path, excessive demand simulation I mean, insufficient supply might speed up price growth next year as well. Taking into account the time lags of the impact of monetary policy, we will need to respond promptly, promptly to this by raising the key rate. Secondly, economic activity is recovering. Considering a faster adaptation of the economy, we have improved the forecast of GDP growth for this year to 05 to 2% range. By the end of next year, the economy will recover to the levels of late 2021, with the growth rate reaching 05 to 2.5%. Further on, the economy will grow by 105 to 2.5% a year. Companies continue to adjust to the new environment. This process is supported by the expansion of private and public demand. According to our assessments, today demand in the economy correlates with the dynamics of product and service output. A faster increase in output is impeded by resource constraints, primarily because of a rather complicated situation in the labour market. The demand for labour continues to grow. Many companies are facing troubles with hiring personnel. This problem is especially urgent in manufacturing. As reported by the Bank of Russia's regional branches, enterprises increased the demand for programmers, construction engineers and low-skilled workers. This is pushing up labour costs, whereas labour productivity might be lagging behind. Thirdly, monetary conditions remain neutral. The slope of the yield curve of federal government bonds has become even steeper, mostly due to declining interest rates on short-term securities with maturities of no more than two years. This is the evidence that market participants' expectations about the probability of the key rate increase have adjusted downwards. This might show how the market has responded to the statistics on current inflation. Interest rates on long-term federal government bonds stay high beginning from last September, which is mostly explained by high uncertainty and expectations of a further expansion of the programme of borrowings by the government. In, in addition, pricing might be affected by limited liquidity in this market segment. Nevertheless, even with these levels of yields and long-term federal government bonds, the credit market continued to actively expand in March. The corporate portfolio notably increased, largely driven by lending to companies engaged in large investment projects. Besides, companies were actively offering bonds. In February-April 2023, bond offerings in the market considerably exceeded the values of the same period in 2019 to 2021, although interest rates on corporate bonds are now higher than during the sad, the sad period. Banks' risks appetite in the retail market was up as well. Credit institutions are very responsive to an improvement of the situation in certain industries and rising wages and are therefore ready to offer more beneficial terms to some borrowers. Furthermore, banks' profits were high in the first quarter, as a result of which they are more confident making decisions on new loans. I would like to stress that March was only the first month of such a noticeable revival, and we will need more data to assess how steady this trend is. In addition to the growth of consumer lending, there are also other signs of a gradual reduction in households' propensity to save. Thus, the proportion of current ruble accounts in households' funds has returned to the peak values of the end of 2021, which implies that banks' customers prefer a more liquid form of savings to be able to quickly use these funds for purchases. Now, I would like to speak of external conditions. The world is still facing threats to financial stability, which will exert pressure on global economic growth. Nevertheless, this growth is supported by the reopening of the Chinese economy. Over a long-term horizon, 
An important factor that will have a significant effect on the world economy will be its continuing fragmentation. Previously established goods, production and delivery chains, systems of settlements, and technology development and exchange terms are altering in a fundamental way. The world economy will apparently become increasingly less integrated. These trends are additionally intensified by, by geopolitical frictions. The impact of both positive and negative factors of the external environment on Russia is limited because of the sanctions. Nevertheless, these effects will translate into the Russian economy, first of all, through the demand for Russian exports, their prices and quantities. In the first quarter, the value of exports contracted compared to last year, although it was close to the upper bound of previous years. Imports continued to expand. Considering these trends, we have slightly lowered the forecast of exports and increased the forecast of imports in our revised forecast of the balance of payments. As a result, the current account balance will decline to 47 billion US this year. I will now speak of the risks that might cause a deviation of inflation from the baseline forecast. Pro-inflationary risks are still higher. In the first place, this is the risk of a possible tightening of the sanctions. The second risk is a stronger deficit in the labor market, which might restrain the structural transformation of the economy and push up prices. The third risk is that supply in production and service markets will lag behind the expansion of consumer demand. Besides, we will continue to closely monitor the progress of the implementation of fiscal policy. Our baseline scenario relies on the current budget targets. If the budget deficit increases further over the medium-term horizon, we might need to tighten our monetary policy. I would like to emphasize that this is the size of the structural deficit rather than the budget expenditure that is essential for us in decision making. As to disinflationary risks, it is possible to speak of a higher propensity to save among households if this trend continues for a longer period. In addition, the increased stocks of agricultural products might contain food price growth further. Winding up, I would like to comment on our future decisions. Because of the time-lagged effects of monetary policy, our future decisions on the key rate will influence increasingly more the inflation rate of the next year already, when inflation should return to the target of 4% and stabilized at this level. The overall uncertainty is persistently high over this time horizon. The range of risks is wide. Moreover, pro-inflationary risks will prevail. However, disinflationary factors might turn out to be longer lasting. Our updated forecast of the average key rate is 7.3 to 8.2% for this year and 6.5 to 7.5 percent range for 2024. These ranges assume that our decisions might vary at the moment. We predict a gradual increase in inflationary pressure until the end of the year. At our next meetings, we will continue to assess whether it is reasonable to raise the key rate in order to stabilize inflation at the target of close to 4 percent in 2024 and further on. Thank you. And dear colleagues, now over to your questions. Please introduce yourselves and name your agency. Anastasia, please. Good afternoon. Xavier Liva Anastasia from Interfax Agency. When do you expect uh, the ruble exchange rate to weakening and uh, translating that into prices? Is it going to be very pronounced or simply because we have stocks is going to be even down and we even won't notice it? Another question about the currency market. What should be the limitation imposed upon the acquisition of currencies um, as part of the deal of uh, the assets being sold by unfriendly businesses so that it would uh, cushion the volatility? of the exchange uh, rates. Uh, could it be 150 million US dollars, like we recall? Uh, another question, do you discuss now as part of the new executive order to place the subsidiaries of foreign banks under the management of the Russian banks? And do you agree with the rationale announced by Minister of Finance yesterday that those of our companies which suffered abroad, they will have assets placed under their management, which previously belonged to foreign owners? 
The weakening of the ruble, nevertheless, is already producing an effect upon inflation. It is just that other disinflationary factors are also at play, and we do believe that it will be more extended over time. Currently, it is being contained by the factor that I referred to, i.e. that many companies created stocks previously. They produced more and against a uh, uh, more beneficial exchange rate, but nevertheless, the weakening of the exchange rate that occurred in the beginning of the year, even if the exchange rate remains at the current levels, that factor in itself is going to be a pro-inflationary one. Mr. Zabotkin, will you add something? Well, it's difficult for me to, to uh, elaborate on this. All right. So now, as far as the limitations are concerned for the government commission to make up its mind with respect to transfers abroad. We do support such limitations to be established. The government commission will announce this specific because it is their authority. And we truly believe that setting up such limitations will help to reduce volatility because such transactions, if they're large scale on top of it, may create a short term volatility in the currency market. But once again, I would like to emphasize I'm, in no way I mean to say that through that we intend to control the exchange rate. The exchange rate remains a floating one. Now, as far as the possibility to place under the management, uh, 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 placing the Russian assets under the management instead of allowing the foreign owners to to simply exit, these decisions must be made with some very strong reasoning uh, in the interest of the functioning of the Russian economy. In the banking sector, we don't uh, think this is worthwhile. Dmitry Butenko, the forecast 2023-2024 uh, about inflation. It is half a percentage uh, lower. That's the way it uh, looks against what you expect. Nevertheless, your signal remains the same, and in your statement, you were more uh, certain uh, saying that at the next board meetings, you will review the uh, key rate with the possibility of uh, raising it, but not lowering it. It is clear. Uh, have you been intentional in making this particular um, statement uh, such a tough one? What are the monetary conditions right now um, after you updated your forecast? Have they remained tougher or have they remained softer? Well, the monetary conditions, we believe, are remaining to be neutrals, approximately the same. There are certain shifts and certain um, uh, diverse movements. Uh, and our logic, uh, indeed, is that we do see that the pro-inflationary risks prevail. Although there are forecast of the key rate, if you take a look at the current year, it allows a certain possibility for the rate to go down. But nevertheless, we believe it is more probable. We consider that um, uh, the key rate going is more probable. Now, how probable it is uh, and whether this probability is stronger or weaker, I won't uh, hypothesize right now because it will follow the real data. But but an important aspect, let me stress it again, we're currently looking at the way our decisions are going to impact inflation of the next year, because next year is when we are truly stating that we would like to bring inflation to the 4% target. This year it can be higher because there is a structural adaptation going on which is uh, taking place faster. But we will be taking into account all the risk in order to bring the inflation back to 4% level. Mr. Zapotkin? Yeah, let me also uh, add that the forecast, I mean, the updating of the forecast itself cannot influence the monetary conditions because the monetary conditions are um, uh, would be uh, subject to our uh, monetary policy uh, decisions. And respectively, we would make an assessment of whether it would be worthwhile to raise the key rate and to bring inflation to the 4% level next year. Thank you. And next question comes from online, uh, Tatiana Lustichkin. The Kursk Pravda. 
Yes, hello, dear colleagues. Um, nevertheless, I would like you to possibly be a little bit more specific. You already mentioned about inflation, that it went down, and you explained why. But nevertheless, because of a weak uh, ruble, uh, this country's economy and the businesses do need money. So why the central bank uh, has not been considering the possibility of reducing the key rate? And is there the probability that it will do so? Thank you. The fact that the annual inflation figures are going down in itself is not uh, the uh, firm ground to reduce it because our monetary policy produces uh, an effect with a lag upon the economy and it is being aimed for the future and for the future inflation as well as the inflationary expectations um, by households, businesses and investors. And so the annual inflation figure that uh, shares the decline, it reflects the past, the average price growth over the previous 12 months. And we have had very low inflation uh, through, uh, through, uh, through the second half of last year. But as of Q4, it uh, has been accelerating. And the monthly rates, I mean, seasonally, they're, even they're already at the 4% level. Uh, so an abrupt slow down of inflation that we can see in the annual figures took place in the summer of last year and we responded very quickly by dramatic reduction of the key rate last year from uh, in September uh, from 20 down to 7.5 percent so currently in order to ensure our ability to reach 4 percent level of inflation next year at this point in time, we see no reason to reduce the rate. But in order to make the lending available to the economy, you need to have price stability in place because predictable low inflation makes lending more affordable for the structural improvement of the economy. Thank you. Uh, dear colleagues, Maria, over there, please, in the first row. Good afternoon. Task Information Agency, Maria Stepanova, I have several questions. The first one, uh, what are the options that you considered today about the key rate during your board meeting? And second, about the mortgage lending. There have been quite a few proposals about the subsidized mortgage lending, for example, subsidized mortgaging for government officials or uh, bringing it into the secondary market. What uh, is uh, the opinion of the regulator upon this? And are you involved in the discussion of it? Today, during the board of directors meeting, we looked into two options, uh, raising the rate uh, and uh, keeping the rate at the current level. And so the decision has been made in favor of keeping it as is. But nevertheless, we also looked into the possibility of raising it as far as the development of mortgage funding is concerned and the programs that you refer to, as far as the subsidised mortgage uh, programs for government officials so in government and the public uh, uh, service uh, uh, is concerned, we didn't discuss that. But uh, as far as I understand, uh, you are talking about the mechanisms to support the public sector and stepping away from the mortgage lending, which would enable many government uh, employees to improve their housing conditions. And as far as the secondary market um, subsidization is concerned, you know, our general approach that uh, over-the-counter subsidized programs are effective as uh, anti-crisis measures, but then they have to be curtailed, and we need to switch over to purpose and beneficiary-specific programs. So as far as this is concerned, I believe that would be very beneficial to bring that also over to the secondary market, because uh, customized programs is not to support the developers, but supporting specific categories of citizens. Uh, doesn't matter how are they trying to improve their housing conditions, buying it in the primary market or the secondary market. We believe that it could also cover the secondary market as well. Yes, thank you. Dmitry in the first row. Dmitry, Russia R24. Uh, good afternoon, uh, dear, dear Governor. First of all, I would like to join in the high appreciation of the work you do on behalf of the Jerome Powell, the head of the Fed, who recently said that you did maximum in order to reduce the effects of sanctions upon Russia. That was uh, his uh, assessment. So I would like to wish the Bank of Russia for more resilience. And my second question about the 
uh, voluntary uh, savings uh, by uh, the citizens that you worked on together with the Minister of Finance. The Minister of Finance believes that the yield on such savings is going to be higher than in the case of the bank deposit. How can you guarantee that? Through what? Well, it is true that with respect to voluntary, I mean, generally, developing voluntary savings uh, uh, programs, long-term savings, is an important priority uh, in our joint work with the Minister of Finance because that will enable uh, people to enjoy new forms of long-term savings as well as provide the economy with longer-term resources. And such voluntary savings can produce uh, better uh, yields compared to the bank deposits because investments are being done for longer term and uh, it could uh, manifest itself in a more diverse portfolio. So not necessarily you need to invest into uh, short term securities, long term securities will uh, be uh, attractive as well. So we're quite watchful over this as far as the non government pension funds are concerned. Um, we are uh, monitoring their investment strategy so as to make sure that they are selecting the kind of assets which are more attractive against the available possibilities while protecting the rights of the future pensions as well as those who invest their money longer term. Besides, this form could be also be more attractive because um, the system of guarantees would cover just big amount of money saved rather than just the, the deposits. Thank you. The next question comes online from Denis Kostoglod of Kaliningrad.ru Information Agency, please. Uh, hello, dear colleagues. I have a question about the digital ruble. Won't the introduction of the digital ruble result in the outflow of money from the banking industry as well as uh, the increase of the lending rates to a reduction of lending activity and how the digital ruble may affect your future monetary policy decisions? Thank you. We do not expect that an introduction of a digital ruble shall be accompanied with some significant outflow of money from the banks. Why? Because, first of all, we're not going to accrue interest upon the uh, money that people keep on the digital accounts, usually the banks in as far as the businesses and household keep as the deposits, uh, they uh, accrue interest because we believe that the digital ruble is the means for settlements and paying rather than for saving. And that will enable one to avoid competition between the digital rules with the bank deposits. In a similar way, we plan to establish uh, the limitations of a monthly nature within which people may transfer money from their cashless accounts to their digital purses or accounts. Uh, monthly limits, uh, if somebody has been accumulating for several months on end, then the whole amount will be uh, eligible for a transfer. We're now having a discussion about that specifically uh, for transferring um, digital rubles into the digital purses. We are always watching over the bank's liquidity. We are ready to support them. We've got all the necessary tools for that. You may recall that last year we also had a situation when there was an outflow of uh, uh, cashless uh, uh, deposits into cash uh, in March and September, but people are uh, calming down and they revert to their old uh, practices. Nevertheless, we've got the tools necessary in order to provide the banks with liquidity if uh, need be. Also, there's a question about how the digital rule may impact lending. Well, the level of rights in the economy in the first place depends upon the key rate as well as the overall policy, I mean monetary policy, that the central bank is pursuing. And so the level of confidence in that policy, the trust towards us being able to bring the inflation back to the 4% level. And the introduction of a digital ruble won't create any impact upon that. The demand for the new form of money is what we're going to take into account when defining the terms for such transactions, because whenever we provide liquidity or absorb liquidity, we always uh, uh, monitor that. But additionally, we'll simply have, as another tool, the digital ruble. So here, in terms of the 
efficiency of our operating procedures. There are no issues, but simultaneously we believe that introducing a digital rubles will positively affect the development of the financial industry and first and foremost in providing the affordability and accessibility in terms of financial services to the public. The competition will strengthen between the banks and that would incentivize banks to offer to people more attractive terms in terms of better interest that they accrue on the deposit will reduce the barriers for transfers because people will always have an alternative to that, which is the digital ruble. Thanks very much, colleagues. Diliara, over there, please. Diliara, Ria Novosti Agency. I've got two questions. The first one is about the rate. Up till what level, as viewed by the central bank, inflation has to grow and the budget deficit needs to grow in order for the central bank to go about the cycle of raising the rate? And my second question, you mentioned that in the second half of the year, the annual inflation will accelerate. Is it going to be significant? Is it possible that we will be seeing the double-digit values again? When we define and determine the rate, we assess the whole complexity of factors and risks. We're not in a position to say that a certain one factor must manifest itself in this particular way, and then we will consider a higher rate. We need to take a holistic and comprehensive look at whether we are achieving the target inflation, which is 4%. So there's no kind of a current inflation level that would set this trigger going. In particularly, uh, there's no budget deficit. Of course, we take into account the current inflation, but what's more important to us are the uh, stable inflation factors. How do they behave? What is the forecast? And of course, the fiscal policy is also is in our, uh, on our radars. And as I mentioned, we act on the kind of the fiscal plans that the government is currently entertaining. But if the budget deficit and structural deficit strengthens, that will be one of the reasons to toughen the monetary policy. But once again, we will take a look. We will need to take a look at the whole set of factor. There could be disinflationary ones, which will compensate for the pro inflationary effect. Now, uh, with regard to the inflation dynamics uh, for the second half of the current year, yes, there are certain pro-inflationary factors. We are currently expecting uh, certain. A rise in the inflation in the stable components. Currently, they are a little bit uh, lower than 4%, but we don't expect the double digit ones. Thank you. Uh, next question comes online from Kira Yuktenka. Invest Future Project, please. Uh, dear colleagues, good afternoon. I represent the interests of private investors, and so my questions are going to be specifically about them. So I may um, uh, ask you permission to raise three questions. The first one is about the frozen shares. Uh, how there was information in the social networks that there was one citizen in Russia based on uh, his individual application uh, while he was located in a different country was able to achieve his assets being unfrozen. Is that true? And uh, is it a reason for us to hope that there might be certain changes? The second question is about uh, restricting access and uh, uh, trading the stocks of the defense industry uh, companies from non-friendly countries. The question is that many investors have already bought these particular shares, and they are frozen. Now the question is, is it going to be a delisting of uh, these uh, shares from the St. Petersburg Exchange? And once they are unfrozen, will people be able to exit these assets without losing money? And my third question is about the new type uh, of uh, these um, uh, uh, assets. First of all, uh, would it be possible to get the deduction on the contribution um, uh, just once or every year? And the second point. Uh, withdrawing money, is it possible only is, is in case there is a life's emergency and this money is being put into the account of a health care institution, or maybe right now it would be possible to do it, uh, but with uh, losing the benefits related to it? Sorry for asking so many questions. 
Well, as far as the frozen assets are concerned, uh, we are familiar with uh, really very, very few uh, cases uh, when permission was granted as well as rejected. We can't say that there is a trend forming itself in terms of the um, unfrozen cases, but uh, the national depository and professional players are working over protecting the rights of our retail investors. As far as uh, access um, uh, of uh, non-friendly securities related to the defense industries are concerned, uh, indeed it is expected that trading in such uh, securities is not going to take place, is going to be prohibited. That uh, apparently will bring about the listing and of course one of the questions that needs to be dealt with in view of this, how the people who uh, previously had acquired this uh, securities would be able to exit uh, them. That is an ongoing work. As far as the new type of uh, the uh, single tax account, um, uh, single investment accounts and uh, withdrawing the money from it, yes, the funds accumulated in these accounts uh, would be allowed to be used in life's emergencies. Such instances are going to be prescribed. This is not just uh, uh, allowing anyone to uh, withdraw this money uh, at one's discretion. No, this is uh, to be related with life's emergencies and that one will need to uh, submit proof that such a life's emergency has occurred. Uh, there is quite a big list of such emergencies because people may uh, face such uh, predicaments and so believe it is important to have it uh, in order to raise the attraction in the long-term savings as well as in in the uh, single investment account uh, system, uh, which will be a long-term tool. Thanks very much, uh, Anna, over on, uh, in the last row. Yes, if I may, I also have two questions, but they're going to be about mortgage uh, industry. Uh, you have already undertaken measures, uh, applying them to the banks which participate in various mortgage programs at very low rates, uh, mortgage rates. You're also warned about the risk related to the tranche uh, mortgaging. Please, uh, could you tell us whether they're going to regulate this, and are there any new ruses that have emerged instead of the ones that are being pulled away from the market. And my second question, we uh, all of a sudden found out uh, from, in, in the announcement made by the president that 80 percent of newly uh, built uh, uh, construction sites haven't been uh, sold, that uh, uh, there is an, a big uh, oversupply. Uh, uh, so in what way uh, the central bank is monitoring this and how it may impact the value of real estate and, as a consequence, further upon inflation, uh, because the real estate market is strongly linked to the consumer demand and the acquisition of construction materials and renovation work and so on and so forth. As far as the tranche-based mortgage is concerned, we don't see any broad um, number of cases. Uh, uh, we are monitoring this market, and if we note that such mechanisms start uh, replicating, we will take measures and uh, publicly to the banks. And uh, overall, we're saying that we're not welcoming this kind of a tranche-based mortgage. If it will continue to develop itself, uh, we will take measures. We don't see any new schemes appearing, but we are quite uh, mindful of it. Uh, they may uh, appear, because we recall from last year's experience how such uh, schemes very quickly uh, appear. Uh, as far as the oversupply of uh, housing is concerned, different situations in different regions. In some regions, you have a bigger share of unsold uh, real estate. Uh, and we believe that, amongst other things, it is the result of a very uh, quick price growth over the previous years, very fast price growth in the primary market. and. We think that if such stocks of unsold housing exist, it cannot be sold to the individuals who are not able to service their mortgage lending. So, 
It cannot be done by simply increasing the risk matrix within the mortgage project. Uh, the price growth rate must go down in order for the things to improve that might bring about a high demand for mortgage. But we are watching out for it. And so all of the housing market indicators is what we keep very much on our radar in order to avoid any systemic risks. Thank you. The next question comes online. Elena Fabricnaya from Reuters. Is the discussion about the uh, growing rate is sub subsiding? Um, at the April meeting, the support for a high rate was stronger or weaker than now. The Minister of Finance is currently discussing the limitations imposed upon the foreigners exiting from the Russian asset. Before that, had they been uh, given the opportunity to buy currency limitlessly? Well, this, uh, the, uh, the discussion about the high rate is not uh, subsiding. We were looking into that during the Board of Directors meeting now, whether uh, there was a stronger or weaker support for it during this meeting, Alexei Boris, which I think it was the same in terms of uh, quite a relative uh, thing to say. But nevertheless, as far as the limits are concerned. When the government commission was deciding to allow uh, first for the deal to take place and then for the funds to be transferred, that was done without any specific uh, scheduling or limits. Uh, sometimes it led to certain fluctuations in the currency market. And so if uh, transactions uh, um, uh, in questions were, were big, then we would support uh, such, establishing such uh, limits and uh, schedules. Gulnarna Vahitva, Russian Gazette, Elvira Sahibzadona. I would like to ask a question about the statistics with respect to the banking sector. Does the central bank plan to disclose the banking sector statistics uh, in categories between the friendly currencies and unfriendly currencies? If positive, one yes. Also, another question about uh, reflecting the weakening ruble in your inflation data. You mentioned that it is going to uh, be an extended phenomenon, but at the same time, you are reduced by a half percentage point to a forecast uh, of inflation. So w what happens is that uh, this uh, extension over time, we're not going to witness this year, only next year. And do you agree with the analysts saying that the main factors of, uh, which uh, influence the rubles, the weakening, have already uh, taken place? As far as disclosing the statistics uh, separately in between the friendly and unfriendly currency, this is what we're currently looking into. No decision has yet been made, but uh, we are aware that both the banks and the analysts, in order to understand what kind of liquidity there is in the market and the structure, uh, they require this information. So we're thinking, and hopefully we will make this decision shortly uh, once we assess all the consequences. As far as uh, the transformation of the weakening ruble uh, into the pricing, yes, it may happen. It happens. It can take time. It can take place at different points in time, and it will definitely happen. Even if the exchange rate remains at the current level, that will be a pro-inflationary effect, including for this year. Why did we reduce our inflation forecast for this year? Well, because there is already uh, uh, the actual data for four months. We also believe that the one-off disinflationary factors, they will have a long-lasting presence, like, for example, including the ones related to the stocks of uh, crop uh, uh, last year, quite a big one. We're also expecting a very good uh, crop yield this year, which may also play as a disinflationary set of factors. Uh, Mr. Zabotkin, would you also uh, say a few words about the factors of the weakening exchange rate? Uh, I think we have spoken about it uh, on more than one occasion. Yes, what we're seeing is that the value of our exports uh, are going down, but at the same time, there is a very quick recovery of imports. So both uh, these uh, phenomena we remember watching and seeing last year and in the course of the quarter this year. And so uh, the weakening of the current uh, account balance uh, has brought about uh, the weakening of the exchange rate. And again, the range within which the exchange rate uh, is floating around uh, is exactly the same as we have been seeing over the next few years, over the past few years. <clears throat> now, in terms of um, 
uh, the forecast, Dmitry Butin previously also raised the same question. I would like to underscore that reducing the forecast by half percentage points in many ways is related to and reflects a much better ability of the economy to adjust itself, particularly in as far as the availability of imports is concerned. And so the pro-inflationary impacts and the limitations on the side of the supply, uh, which occurred because of the sanctions last year, they are being resolved much more successfully than we anticipated. And so currently, the kind of inflation that is going to be related to it is going to be lower. Thank you. Dear colleagues, please, Margarita in the second row. Margarita Mordovina, RBK. I will have two questions. The first one is about the currency restrictions. Um, not so long ago, you stated that uh, the set of currency restrictions is not going to be dramatically changed, but at the same time, you mentioned that there could be some fine tuning. Could you please be more specific? What did you mean by fine tuning? Uh, the current currency restrictions uh, becoming more lax uh, or tougher? The second question about uh, the Russian investor assets, which became frozen in February, you delayed uh, discussing the issue of setting up a compensatory fund because there used to be various uh, speculations that uh, uh, about an impending unblocking. It doesn't seem to be, but since there is no trend uh, uh, for this to be unfrozen, one should go back to the compensatory fund being set up. Thank you. Thank you. As far as the currency restrictions and fine tuning are concerned, it's not expressly about toughening or weakening. We're talking about fine tuning the currency restrictions in as far as the legal entities are concerned, simply that many companies call us, they are telling us about various uh, specifics that they encounter in foreign trade, and we take it into account, and we are ready to take into account, we can take it into account uh, when uh, making the current currency restrictions more specific. So our task here is not to allow for currency restrictions to impede foreign uh, trade. And we're specifically talking about uh, legal entities. Now, in as far as the idea is concerned to set up a compensation fund, we have been discussing it, and there have been certain hopes that uh, the uh, assets are going to be unblocked. I mean, the one that belonging to the Russian in investors, the one who were not sanctions, the one who previously had invested into foreign securities. Yes, we do acknowledge that uh, there's no trend like that just yet. But nevertheless, the idea of such a compensation fund is uh, difficult to implement. So we are looking into various options. The businesses have uh, contacted us offering some new ones. So there aren't any final decisions, because practically all of the options are very complex, apart from the fact that they impact the legislative change. One needs to be sure that the rights of our investors are being protected. They're not going to be contested or disputed. We need to uh, assess the extent to which that might involve the decisions of foreign regulators, uh, regulators which would be difficult to secure. So we are having different discussions, but the idea uh, of the compensation find, fund right now, uh, we believe, is difficult to um, uh, execute. The next uh, question comes from Tatiana Voronova. Frank Media, good afternoon, dear colleagues. My question is related to the uh, 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 federal bond localized in Russia. The amount of such uh, papers that have relocated to Russia is quite immense. The uh, trading in it is quite limited right now. What is the strategy that the financial authorities are pursuing right now? Do you hope that people will hold these uh, securities until maturity? And how the market may digest uh, the overhang of uh, such uh, securities without pressurizing the overall federal bonds? There was some hope that the overall sanctions uh, might be reduced for the banks, uh, otherwise which could have produced pressure upon ruble in April. And is it true that uh, is it true uh, at all? And I would like to understand whether there have been uh, many transactions taking place to uh, take into account to uh, uh, offset uh, such securities. Uh, my other question about the zero rate mortgage, because this particular topic is coming to the end of its life cycle. 
cycles, so I would like to find out how much of the zero mortgage currently the banks hold. Do you believe such portfolios to be toxic in terms of accounting for uh, the bank's uh, income from such lending? Has the central bank been successful, do you believe, to bud the risks of the cheap mortgage and how much impairment the banks will need to establish to, to comply with the new requirements? Thank you. As far as the federal bonds bought from the foreigners and non-residents by the Russian market players, indeed, they are being held in portfolios till maturity. And in the meantime, we haven't changed our approach. We believe that is where they should stay. We don't see that this order of things is being overturned. Uh, certainly, some of the um, um, uh, cases they have been uh, paid off uh, by uh, the federal bonds, uh, but uh, they were not uh, frequent, uh, and they haven't produced any major effect upon the financial situation as far as as far as uh, the impact upon the exchange rate in April. We believe that the situation with uh, the transaction between the residents and non-residents in acquiring the federal bonds didn't uh, happen. The primary impact came from the current account, I mean the import and export dynamics, because the uh, basic uh, transactions uh, in buying such federal bonds, they took place last year. And so if there had been any impact at all, it uh, took place last year. Now, with respect to the near zero mortgage rate. The amount of uh, um, subsidized mortgage from developers, uh, based on our estimates, run up to 700 billion rubles um, in terms of the share from the overall mortgage lending. That is about 5 percent, meaning to say that uh, the uh, that doesn't really create a uh, problem for the overall bank's mortgage portfolio because we had a concern at some point in time, and so we uh, um, contained it, and we're not going to allow it to become a problem. Now, the extent to which this 5 uh, percent uh, mortgage portfolio may turn itself into a risk will depend upon the way situation may evolve further in the housing market. This risks may emerge uh, in what kind of a situation if the housing prices don't grow and a flat or an apartment that uh, an individual received from a developer is already overpriced and, uh, for example, somebody would need to uh, exit from this asset in the secondary market because of uh, certain life situations changing. In this case, risks are going to manifest themselves. And within part, the risk may stay elevated to within about four or five years of this loan's life cycle. We see that the developer's mortgage offering under the new regulations, we uh, warned the developers in the end of last year. Uh, and as of the start of this year, the close to zero mortgage almost disappeared, but uh, in other uh, mortgage arrangements uh, came to the market at about three to five percent, and there is a bit of a uh, um, uh, artificial increase. Uh, but we see that the regulation is producing a fact that this particular mortgage is dwindling now in terms of the impairment requirements that could be new that would cover the new lending that will start that that started as of March 15th so if the banks continue to issue uh, such mortgage loans, they will definitely have to create respective impairments to uh, suit it next uh, Marina please Marina Pimino, Business News, NTV program, the Central Bank, on more than one occasion was uh, talking against the cryptocurrency circulating in Russia because of the risks to the citizens. At the same time, the Central Bank is uh, promoting the digital ruble. Now, does the digital ruble has or present any risks to the general public? Well, the, general, the digital ruble and cryptocurrencies are absolutely 
different things. The digital ruble doesn't have any risks whatsoever. This is a national form of fiat currency, so to say, because we are clear about who is issuing it, who is using it, because cryptocurrency, they are not um, covered by anything. Uh, who is behind it? The, the digital ruble is like a cash or cashless, cashless um, national currency unit. No risk there. All right. The next question comes online from Dmitry Bondarenko. Simply about finance podcast from the city of Kirovsk. Dmitry, please ask your question. Yes. Uh, hello. Good afternoon. I hope you can hear me. My question is as follows. What is the amount of digital rubles that are expected to be released into circulation in between 2024 to 2026? And the second question is that transactions by way of digital rubles, as was stated, would be possible to do without having access to the Internet. Could you please explain how that might work and within which period of time it may become practically possible? Well, thank you. The Bank of Russia is not establishing any target uh, indicators in terms of the volume of the digital rubles. And we are not trying to increase uh, their quantities. We believe that such an alternative as a digital ruble will create a good benefit for the citizens on top of being able to keep their money on deposits. Um, and so if they keep it there, then the banks would accrue more interest to such uh, accounts because people will have a free alternative. And most probably that will express itself in the people's ability to earn more income from when they place their assets, such assets, into the bank. And so the amount of uh, the um, emission of uh, issuance of the digital rules will depend upon the demand from the general public. It is going to be absolutely uh, voluntarily, uh, people will decide for themselves what is their desired form in each particular case. Uh, should it be a cash? Should it be cashless money, digital rubles that uh, could apply to paying pensions and wages, for example, to the government sector people? But as I stated, nevertheless, we. <clears throat> We are planning to establish maximum uh, threshold for people to be able to uh, put more money into their cashless accounts. That is necessary in order for the banks to enjoy certain predictability of a potential outflow of uh, money on the deposits into digital rubles. As you know, we're currently running a pilot project. We did some testing. Uh, I mean to say we will launch now into the pilot uh, phase. Um, uh, and before the digital ruble is out there, we would be working on a pilot as long as necessary, as a minimum until the end of this year, maybe longer. But as far as the digital ruble application technology is concerned in places where there is no internet. We believe that is one of the advantages that the digital ruble may offer. We are working on it. This is a difficult thing uh, based in, uh, I mean, uh, difficult in terms of its technology. We will be able to share with you the time frame once we are confident that the technology is ready to go. Sergey, next one, please. Sergey Bolotov, arguments and facts. My first question uh, is, again, about the digital rubles. You are saying that this is a uh, form of a national currency, and it is equivalent to cashless or cash ruble. But at the same time, the digital ruble is not the means to save. There is no interest that is going to be accrued on it, and just to keep them on an account uh, is not interesting. Do you see that there is a contradiction uh, in it, that one of the forms of the national currency is not the means to accumulate money? It is just uh, straightforward uh, money. Next, about the exchange rate when some of our men uh, were mobilized partially in autumn, uh, getting paid 200,000, uh, uh, which was a little bit uh, less than 3,000 US. So they couldn't buy whatever they wanted. What had happened? Once they're back from trenches, they will see that uh, they would uh, be able to buy less foreign and domestic products. And the third question about the rupees. India is actively buying oil and other products from Russia for rupees. And so the experts, communities are saying, People are saying that the exporters are <coughs> facing difficulties in repatriating these rupees and transferring, transforming them into rubles. So is it a problem when finally the instruments will be made available for the Russian exporters and importers in rupees? Uh, and do you recommend that anybody should be uh, keeping that? 
as an instrument of payment. As far as the digital rubles are concerned, is the ability to say, we are saying that this is the instrument for payment rather than saving. Why? Because uh, one, uh, one can do free transfers, but the interest is not going to be uh, accruing. And, you know, why we're saying that this is not the form of saving. I mean, you can accumulate money, you know, in digital rubles, no problem about that. But when you talk about saving, that is keeping your purchasing power intact. I mean, that they're not being undermined by inflation. And interest should be accrued, even if the inflation is about 4%, because the inflation will be there, whatever, and so that your savings don't uh, uh, shrink in terms of their purchasing power so that people could keep it up. Somebody needs to accrue interest, but that can happen only to a cashless rubble. I mean, formally, you can accumulate cash as well, but in my mind, that is not the way to save because interest, uh, this cash money doesn't earn interest. And so if you uh, stack it in cash, if inflation is happening, their purchasing capacity is being diminished. So once again, you can save, but that is uh, not uh, the form of uh, saving per se. Now, um, uh, with respect to your second question, the purchasing power is being defined by inflation, rather. I mean, how much money you need to spend uh, to buy a certain number of services or products, rather than how much currency, or US dollars or whatever, you can buy. That is the more important thing for the people. And what we're trying to do is for inflation to go down so that the purchasing power of the money remains. That is price stability. That is something that keeps the money of our citizen from losing value. In, in order for the savings to retain its purchasing power, you can place it into a bank deposit. The kind of interest that the banks are currently offering, 6 7%, for example, that a depositor will able to enjoy in some time after the deposit runs to its maturity. That will cover the overall price growth throughout that time. So their purchasing power of the money saved in that form shall sustain. Now, as far as the third question is concerned, indeed, currently we are actively um, moving into international settlements in different national currencies, but this transition is different in different cases because some of the national currencies have uh, limitations, including currency uh, limitations. And yes, indeed, uh, Indian rupees is something that our exporters uh, find difficult to repatriate. Um, one uh, uh, should either offset <coughs> such r rupees with uh, uh, imports. I mean, the importers need to start importing something from India and paying for rupees, or they need to invest into certain rupee-dominated assets. These are the issues that we're familiar with, and we are discussing them as far as the financial assets are concerned, and instruments denominated in rupees, which are going to be made available in the Russian market. Hardly likely that will happen in the foreseeable future, because India has uh, certain currency restrictions to cope with. Dear colleagues, the next question comes online from Yekaterina Litova from Petromosti. Good afternoon. Can you please tell us to what extent uh, the central bank believes the outflow of capital is taking place because of the uh, exit of foreign companies from the Russian markets? Uh, my other question is about Nordnikel recently launching its uh, um, uh, digital financial assets uh, to offer to its uh, employees for incentivization program. So how does Central Bank think about it? Do you believe that this may lead to the digital financial asset market, which has just about started developing, may uh, to a certain extent uh, uh, lead to the Russian investors being disappointed because somehow they get the uh, digital financial asset linked to a share, but in actuality, people don't own it. As far as the outflow of capital abroad is concerned to separately um, 
speak about a category related to the divestiture from assets by non-resident entities is, is, is difficult because the statistics uh, don't yet um, give us uh, these uh, figures, but uh, uh, that does create impact upon the payment balance, definitely. Mr. Zapotkin, do you have any specific figures? Looking at the past year, when we disclosed uh, as part of our annual report um, uh, and uh, in the in, in the Russian parliament, yes, we spoke about it, which is the reduction of equity participation in terms of the portfolio and in other forms amounted to about 35 billion US dollars. But that was not foreign companies exiting. That was a broader kind of investment categories. As far as the digital financial assets is concerned, I'm not going to comment on specific uh, instruments. Without doubt, uh, what is truly important for us is for uh, the invested into the digital financial assets to have their rights and entitlements secured so that they understand the risks related to such securities, what they can gain. Um, uh, from them, that applies to any investments in the securities market, irrespective of a form, digital or conventional one. We're going to monitor it with attention. Uh, colleagues, uh, Anna, in the last row, please. Good afternoon, Anna Gromera. Um, Anna Finance blog. Elvira uh, Sahibzadovna, thank you so much for the work you're doing and from my subscribers I'm expressing enormous participation. I was gathering questions for this particular conference because some of the questions you have already answered. Thank you very much. But I decided to ask a question more related to the basics of financial literacy. Well, very much. Uh, we would like uh, for the cold calls to be fully prohibited because a financially literate person uh, selects and chooses a uh, low on understanding what he needs it for. But the cold calls, well, soon vacation is coming and everybody needs money, uh, basically leads to people being emotional in uh, borrowing uh, without understanding what they're doing. And so these are the bad loans with the really not very attractive terms for simple people. And so allowing for the spam or aggressive promotion and advertising for expensive, easily available loans uh, ends up in not helping people as a credit instrument, making those uh, who are not financial literate to suffer. Now, does the central bank has any plan to try and control this situation? Because in some countries, we know that there is a, an instituted punishment that is being imposed upon companies who advertise their services such a way. Although I know that is a bit of a conflict of interest because the central bank supports the, bank, the banking system, which means that advertising lending supports commercial banks' operation. But uh, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, uh, what is more important to support uh, a uh, person in the street who is not very knowledgeable about it or a banking entity? Well, thank you very much for your very important uh, question very essential one. Well, I can tell you that we don't feel this conflict of interest in our case because the most important thing to us is to protect the rights of consumers in financial operations. All the financial institutions must be stable, but the whole idea behind them being in existence is providing financial services. We have always been combating the practices when some financial institutions finding themselves in not very good situations were trying to improve their positions through various fraud schemes like laundering that we have been struggling against and various illegal transactions. Quite often recently we see that people are being deceived, that things are being forced upon them. And so this aggressive advertising that you are referring to has become a big headache for the people in the street. And so when people are quite emotional when accepting something they don't need and once uh, they refuse it, you know, these endless telephone calls, they make people irritated. The second, what we uh, are, are, uh, our approach is that any financial product must have a certain consumer value. One cannot and should not force upon people something that doesn't offer any value. As far as the advertising and promotional um, angles are concerned, seemingly this is a simple thing, but it's very difficult to really beat it. Because 
because quite often people grant their consent to receive calls and advertising, signing off on a long, fine printed contract even without noticing that they have given their consent to. So the first thing that we want to do is for such a consent to be formalized via a separate document with a separate signature affixed to it so as to make individuals pay attention and be aware of it via a special form on a website and there must be an end date for such a consent. It cannot be extended automatically while well, uh, a certain period of time uh, expires and um, th there should be certain guidelines given to that. So that consent disappears. If an individual never gave a consent and the calls are coming in People can complain to the antitrust authority, but people must be sure that they haven't given any consents. We would also look into what kind of additional measures we can undertake in order to uh, um, fight against this. Uh, thank you. Next uh, question from online from Tatiana Chupasova, Interfax. Good afternoon. I've got two questions. Have the central bank uh, considered uh, the amount of money that the uh, banks uh, are going to contribute into the fiscal system uh, uh, in the form of the windfall tax? And will the central bank's idea will be taking into account that only the banks uh, that are not receiving support from the central bank should be part of this? Towards the end of June, um, some of the banks are not going to have uh, the benefits provided by the central Bank uh, f formally in the past year, and uh, can you please give us a few more details? What is going to be modified, and what kind of regulation shall remain on a permanent basis? As far as one of contribution into the fiscal system is concerned, uh, my colleagues in the central bank have been um, assessing it uh, per every bank which potentially falls under such a uh, requirement. There's no major impact upon their financials, uh, uh, neither on their financial stability. I'm not in a position to quote uh, uh, the uh, general uh, figure to you, but uh, with regard to such uh, taxes, uh, uh, to be paid only by those who are not using any regulatory easing. Well, in any way, when making an assessment of the profit throughout 2021-22, these regulatory easing should be excluded. So this is more of a question towards the um, base of estimation. So what we act upon is that is not to come from the profit which uh, was achieved uh, by using regulatory easing. As far as the uh, future of uh, additional easing is concerned. We're currently debating the way we're going to take these measures, and as always, we will tell you a full story about what is going to stay, what is going to be altered, um, and what is not going to be extended uh, um, uh, at a later occasion. Ivan, over to you, please. Ivan Schlegin for my guru. Two short questions. The first one is about M2. Some experts. <clears throat> Looking at M2 growing, call it a serious pro inflationary factors. Others disagree with it, believing that this is just a technical indicator which is not really worthwhile uh, paying serious attention to in this context. That was my first question. My second question about the Eurobond market. Many of our major businesses for many years have been getting debt finance from the West. Now this market has been close to them. Now in view of this, are there any problems that such companies are facing with available funding? Will the domestic market be able to go through that strain, funding them? What kind of mechanisms are there apart from the substitution bonds in order to support domestic businesses? Thank you. Yes, quite rightly, you mentioned the substitution bond because such a substitution of external funding with domestic one is very active nowadays, and one of them is substitution bonds as an instrument. We believe that this bond market is quite capable of um, persevering through the declining foreign funding. For example, the foreign borrowing, and I mean in terms of what the Russian businesses need to pay in terms of euro bonds, this year is going to be a little bit over 7 billion US dollars. But as far as 2022 is concerned, there is the corporate bond market. Overall, it has grown by one third from 10 trillion to 12.3. So this amount of 7 billion 
uh, accounts for about 20% of the overall market, incremental market growth last year. So this country's market is quite capable of substituting it. Of course, we all have to work over improving the attraction in the minds of investors towards such bonds. So disclosing information, improving uh, corporate governance practices are the necessary elements in order for investors to be more keen in investing into the Russian securities. As far as M2 indicators is concerned, we're certainly looking at the money aggregates, not only in them, because last year we paid more attention to M2X, which is a broad money mass uh, which takes into account the currency component. Why is it important? Because we specifically have been going on through this axis substitution, the one that you have referred to. I mean, the currency borrowings with the ruble denominated one, the currency deposit and banking system were switched into the ruble denominated one. And so that uh, basically affected M2 in terms of uh, it growing very fast. But we expect this process to round up and to decline. And so the M2 and M2 X rates of growth are going to be conversion. I mean, what is the percentage that we're expecting? About two to three percent difference. Yeah, in between M2 and M2 X. Yeah, but uh, generally speaking, the money supply we do view within the context that it affects the economic uh, demand and inflation. Mr. Zabotkin, please. Well, I suppose uh, an, an important comment here is also that uh, the money uh, supply growth last year. Um, stayed at uh, very high uh, levels for many years, even from M to X, uh, the 14, 15 percent in terms of the annual growth was quite high. If you look at uh, the history of it from 2014, 15, which was conditioned, amongst other things, by more extended settlement um, uh, uh, processes, which required more money in order to uh, service the economic uh, operations and activities. And also part of the funds which which uh, previously uh, was injected into the Russian economy by the foreign banking system uh, somehow has now gone in here, uh, becoming part of the local money mass. Uh, and specifically, this is uh, the money supply that has been substituted from uh, foreign sources. And that was your second question. However, this process is also finite. And I suppose that in order for inflation to stabilize around 4 percent, one requires a little bit lower rates of money supply compared to what we recall from last year. Thank you. The next question comes online from Evgeny Pismino from Bloomberg. Because of the temporary military operation, the number of the failed central bank offices is growing. Are there more numbers? I mean, more people are being hired. You know, are there any IT solutions that are being implemented? Well, the only thing I can tell you is that the field offices perform their functions in full compliance with what is written in the legislation. Thank you. Uh, yes, Dmitri. Yes, so you had another question, please. Uh, in the second row, please. Yes, in the statement by the Board of Directors, it says, I mean, the expected central bank uh, response to uh, the greater budget deficit this year. Uh, to what extent your fiscal forecast might uh, change if the reverse thing will happen? It happens if the budget deficit is uh, lower. Well, this is going to be a disinflationary factor, most obviously. No, no, I'm, I'm afraid it's going to be a more complex thing. I mean, uh, what will be the reason behind that uh, fiscal deficit is going to be smaller? I mean, in terms of the fluctuation of the oil and gas revenues, uh, rather than depending up, that doesn't produce an impact upon the, uh, um, you know, uh, and is being compensated by the fiscal rule. But even from the point of view of non-gas deficit, what's really significant is the way this particular deficit is going to be funded. So in terms of there being any direct uh, simple correlation, uh, no. But at, f at a first glance, like uh, the governor said, the contraction of the structural deficit is what makes a negative contribution into the aggregate demand um, the picture compared to an alternative scenario and respectively against all other things being equal. Uh, 
uh, it uh, presupposes a softer uh, monetary policy uh, as opposed to a more significant structural deficit. Dear colleagues, the very last question comes online. Alexei Chernomerdin, the Ural business consulting from Ekaterin Bird. Throughout 2020, during the beginning of 2023, some very serious financial contributions were made into the Russian economy, both in terms of the social security payments as well as helping businesses to solve business substitution, which didn't bring about higher prices. At the same time, consumer activity uh, remains subdued. Do you consider uh, the possibility of going back to the helicopter money uh, options to stimulate consumer activity. Well, let me start from the, uh, the helicopter money. You may recall our position. We are against the helicopter money. We are for individualized, customized support for socially vulnerable groups of people uh, during the period of time when uh, incomes uh, go down uh, dramatically. Some of the countries uh, we know uh, resorted to helicopter money during the pandemic in order to stimulate demand. But after lockdowns were finished, these countries were confronted by a big overhang of unmet demand and many savings and so restricting demand didn't make it possible to produce sufficient goods. And so as a result, inflation in these countries grew up to 40-year-long maximum. And so people didn't find any help in this money. So we're not changing our attitude on this. As far as the consumer activity is concerned specifically, indeed, the consumer demand has been subdued because of uncertainties, a high norm of savings currently. It is declining. The consumer demand is recovering. An important indicator thereof is much recovery uh, in uh, retail lending. And the fiscal support last year uh, specifically compensated this uh, decline in consumer demand. We had it, and so the fiscal system, through its spending, was able to compensate for it. So effectively, such a fiscal support made it possible to prevent excessive decline in aggregate demand as well as it uh, uh, improved certain things on the supply side. So we entered into this year with the price growth rate at about 4%, but specifically as the consumer uh, sentiments recover and confidence. The consumer demand is broadening. We already see it uh, through the incoming data. If the size of the government demand is not going to change, that that may lead to a stronger pro pro-inflationary pressure. So our task is to pursue the monetary policy in such a way to take these things into account so that the whole of the aggregate dynamics in terms of the demand, both on the government side, on the consumer side, uh, could be comparable to the economic capacity to grow the output of goods and services in order to make sure that the inflation stays at the target level. Dear colleagues, thank you very much for your interest and for your questions. Thank you.